Hi, everybody. Hey. Um, I'd ask how you're doing, but you can't reply. Um, <laughs> Ashley, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. How are you doing? I'm good. Um, it's so awesome to have everybody here, even though we can't see you. Um, it's very satisfying to see the numbers on the right side of the screen. Um, my name is Carl. I'm the Artistic Programs Manager at Playwrights. And I'm Ashley Chang, and I'm the Dramaturg at Playwrights. Um, it is just, like I said, super cool to be connected tonight. Um, you know, this is obviously a really challenging, um, disorienting, painful time um, in our community. But um, we're really grateful tonight for the opportunity to connect with all of you, um, members of our Playwrights family. Um, you know, we, we, the staff at Playwrights is continuing to collaborate and work together right now, even though we can't be in the same space, uh, trying to figure out how we might continue to fulfill our mission right now, which is to celebrate um, new plays and musicals and their writers. So this program, the Perspectives on Playwriting or POP program is one of the ways that we do that. And this program has been alive for about four years. This is the fifth kind of series, um, season of events. Um, and, you know, normally we host master classes in the Sharp Theater uh, and we can have 128 people with us, which is great. Um, and we love being in the same space together, of course. Uh, but even though we can't do that, we, we can connect here in this digital sphere. And the silver lining is that we can reach many more people and include people who aren't in New York, who aren't in the United States um, in these kinds of opportunities. Uh, the program was born out of a desire to connect audiences and our artists in a new way and dig in and investigate and celebrate process in with a little bit more um, care, like a, a greater depth. And the hope is that as we continue to produce new work that behaves in all sorts of different kinds of strange ways that we are offering it up with great generosity and making sure that we're including our audience um, with love and that we're providing you the tools to engage with the work um, thoughtfully and carefully. So that's sort of why we're doing this. Um, I, I would also say that many people come to these events because they are theater makers, they are creators, and they're looking for um, insight that might inform their own practice. And that is great. We're thrilled that you're here. Um, additionally, a lot of people are probably here and come to these events who are not makers of any kind, but just love the theater, um, are great admirers of Claire in this case, or of her beautiful play Dance Nation or her other work, um, or, uh, you know, are just looking for insight into something totally new, perhaps um, some inspiration. And that is awesome. We are thrilled that you're here too. Um, and I would just say that I think we will, we are going to do some interactive writing exercises tonight. And so for those of you who are writers, that might feel pretty comfortable, you might be pretty confident. And for those of you who are not writers, I, I am definitely not a writer, but I, I, I invite you to to participate just in the spirit of, of trying something new and, and in the hopes that it might illuminate something that will inform the way that you engage with um, new writing for the theater. Um, that's my spiel. Now I'll turn it over to Ashley. Cool. Um, I'm just gonna give a brief overview of our order of operations for tonight. So we've got um, over 200 people here in the Zoom webinar with us, and we've got another 200 some people in the um, YouTube joining us live there. Um, so Claire is gonna take the floor for the first 40 to 45 minutes or so leading us through a presentation. Um, and Carl and I will be floating nearby off screen in case we just need to pop in. Um, but then Carl and I will reemerge um, after Claire's presentation for a Q&A of roughly 20 to 30 minutes. So please feel free to stay for as much of that as you would like. Um, we are going to be using the Q&A feature during Zoom or in Zoom for this. And so y'all can post questions there. I think you can do it anonymously if that feels comfortable for you. You can also upvote questions, which is a great way to let us, Carl and I, know what, um, what people are interested in hearing. 
Um, and for folks on YouTube, you're able to post questions in that chat feature over there. Carl and I have an eye on that. And May, our 2019-2020 Literary Fellow is going to be present there to help us keep tabs on, on what people are interested in knowing. Um, so we probably won't be able to get to everything this evening, but we're going to do our best to keep things moving and answer as many questions as we can. And uh, just a reminder that we are recording this event for potential release down the line. And without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Claire for her lesson. You guys, I'm coming. She's there coming. I can feel it. There you are. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Okay, I'll disappear. Have fun. Hi, Carl. I'll, Bye, I'll Ashley. Be just to the side. Bye. Bye, guys. Hi, everyone. I'm Claire. Um, I'm in Bedside in Brooklyn. I just wanted to start by saying, like, I send you guys all love. I hope you're in good health. I hope your loved ones are in good health. Um, I feel like we're probably all coming to this from different days, different time zones. I feel like I've had kind of an intense day. So I just invite you to like stretch it out, relax. I'm drinking mezcal. I also have seltzer. You should get a beverage of your choice, a tea, a drink, a, anything that makes you feel comfortable. Um, I hope we'll just get to spend a nice little amount of time together. Um, as Carl mentioned, we're going to be doing some very, very gentle writing tonight. And I just invite you, like my first teacher um, is an, was an uh, incredible performer and playwright named Deb Margolin. And um, I met Deb when I was an actor. So I pursued acting before I um, pursued playwriting. And Deb believed that every person could be a writer. And she really empowered us all. She was working with a group of actors and she empowered us all to like trust in our voice and um find our own particular weird little way of like tapping into desire and like what we want to write so um i just wanted to sort of start tonight by shouting out deb margolin if you guys are looking for like quarantine reading i think her work is extraordinary she has a book called of all the nerve that's of all the nerve with um some of her plays in it um and it's she's definitely worth um spending a lot of time with. I return to her again and again. And with invoking Deb in mind, I just, tonight we're all writers. We're all gonna be doing this together. Um, I, uh, I, I wanted to say a couple things. First of all, I just wanted to share that like I've been having a really hard time being productive during quarantine. Like I, I've had weeks where I have not written a single word. I swear to God, a day that I achieved like 45 minutes of creative writing, to me is like become like a huge triumph. Um, I really applaud if you if you're have, if you're feeling like really productive, like, oh my God, I'm getting so much done. Um, like go with it. That's awesome. For whatever reason, I've felt like very, very um stuck. So I just wanted to share that with you tonight and be like, this is gonna be just a tiny, tiny half hour where we can all be a little bit productive together, a little bit creative together. If there's one thing I've learned, it's like when you're feeling stuck, when you're feeling um, tired, don't try to work an eight hour day, try to work for 45 minutes. Like don't try to bite off a huge bite. Just be like, okay, I can do anything for 90 minutes. I'm gonna sit down and all I'm gonna do is do my work, be creative, try something for 90 minutes and that's it. So today we're just gonna take a little tiny, 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 tiny step, gentle step <laughs> towards being um, creative. The other thing I wanted to say is, um, in my experience as a writer, all of my best writing that I've ever written, I've written when I felt good. I've, it's, I've never been one of these like depressed kind of writers. So like if you take a, a play of mine um, that I've written, my least favorite part of that play is the part that I rewrote 40 times. Like there's a part of, there's a part of Dance Nation, I swear to God, I wrote that fucking scene. If you go into my drafts file, you'll see like 40 documents of like scene 14, like over and 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 over again. And I fucking hate it. And like, that's the part of the play that anytime it comes up in the theater, I'm like, all right, that's like not so great. But the parts of the play that I love are like the parts of the play that I wrote literally in one take literally when I was like enjoying it and feeling good. And so for me as a writer, I try not to think about writing as torture. I try to think about writing as something that feels good, makes me feel good. And I try to um, 
tackle that by writing in little tiny chunks and not punishing myself, but like accepting what I can do. And also then like letting the inspiration catch me when it catches me. If I'm in the shower, if um, I'm on the subway, I, um, and that's also why I do this crazy stuff. I said in the directions, I hope you all got about like the paper and the pens. The reason I do that is for me, they're just little ways to like break myself out of my head and try to make the writing process more fun. So I literally like write almost all my plays in Sharpie because it just feels kind of like ridiculous to write a play in permanent marker <laughs> or write a monologue in permanent marker, but it just makes me feel good. Um, I always like, I'll show you, this is, I, I work on the floor because that's where I feel good. I don't know if you guys can kind of see my, that's my workstation. Um, and um, I'm always like using crazy paper, like I write in big things like this. Um, I write, um, I had this crazy paper that I got that I like lot that I just like unfurl and like lie out on the floor. I love weirdly like writing on um, envelopes. I don't know why it just feels transgressive and good. But like, again, these are all like little tricks I do to make myself feel good, to make myself have fun, to make me feel like, cause seriously, like when you sit down with like some big butcher paper and like a bunch of colored markers. Um, I don't know, it just feels, I feel like I like my job better <laughs> than when I'm like sitting on my laptop, like trying to fill up a blank page. So whatever you gather tonight is great. I just wanted you to gather things that made you feel good, that made you feel like a little bit excited to write with the way like a new pen can feel kind of like exciting to um, write with. So the other, the final thing I wanted to say before we get started is here are some tenets that have literally changed my life. Literally, I, I would not ever finish a play without them. And they come from um, Mac Wellman. I studied at Brooklyn College and also Young Jean Lee. I got a lot of these things from Young Jean Lee. So I just want to shout out Mac Wellman and Young Jean Lee and truly um, life changing for me. The first one is make it bad. Do not try to write a good play. Do not try to write a good scene. For all of you non-writers out there, make it the stupidest fucking thing that's ever been put down on paper ever. Make it like egregiously bad. Like embarrass yourself by writing something that's so embarrassing, so emotional, so on the nose, so cliche, so whatever it is, like make it bad. I feel like the kiss of death is when people try to write a good play. That's when I think it just ends up... Um, tanking and I feel like when you're trying to make it bad like weird accidents and miracles happen another trick I use a lot is make it boring do not try to make it interesting try to write something dull I was um, in the Soho Rep Writer Director Lab when Jenny Schwartz and Kenra Schmall were running it and their first exercise they gave us was to to write like a really boring scene like make it as boring as possible and that became the first scene of my play um, called You Got Older. And like, I would have never written, if I had sat down and like, oh, I'm going to write like a new play today, I would have like tried to make it interesting, right? I would have tried to like do something cool with it, but something about them telling me make it boring, it actually like unlocked this father-daughter relationship for me and like gave me a new play that I, I don't think I would have discovered without, without that. And so the other thing I wrote down is like, make it stupid, that that's similar to like, make it bad. Don't try to be smart, try to be dumb. Always try to be dumb. These things really help me. So with all of that um, in mind, take your um, paper, whatever you're gonna use, maybe get on the floor if you wanna get on the floor, get in your bed if you wanna get in your bed, refill your drink if you wanna refill your drink. And we're gonna start by writing a little, just like free write. Um, this is inspired, I'm single. Um, <laughs> I'm, I've been spending a lot of quarantine well, I've, uh, alone um, and no one has been touching me. So this is like a little shout out I, to all the single people out there um, who really need to get fucked. But <laughs> um, uh, we're gonna write we're going to write about what we want, what you want someone to do to your body. 
what you want someone to do to your body. And it doesn't have to be sexual. I said that thing about single people getting fucked because that's where my brain is and that's what I'm going to write about. But if you are living in a house full of kids, people are touching you all the time. What do you want someone or something to do to your body? Maybe it's not a person. Maybe you want water to do something to your body. Maybe you want to be in the shower. Maybe you want to be outside naked in the rain. But what do you want someone to do to your body? We're just going to write for about five minutes. And you can literally just like make a list. You can be like, you can write like bad sex. You can like describe what it feels like to be in the shower, describe what it feels like to have the wind. Like we had this war, this incredible, like warm weather some days. And like, I went for a run the other day and just a sports bra and just like felt the wind on my body. It felt so good or make it really dirty or make it really nasty. Like, what do you want someone to do to your body? We're just going to write a little bit. How do you want to be touched right now? If you could be touched by anything, anyone. If no one was watching or maybe someone is watching. And who is that person watching? Also play with how big you're writing. You're like, I'm, I'm like writing like three words per page. And then I'm like, turn the page. I'm like, suck my pussy, turn page. Okay. Like it doesn't, you know, play with how you're writing on the page, play with what color you're using. Maybe you want to write really small. What do you need right now? If you could be your most vulnerable, if you could really ask for what you need, how you need to feel. Something weird or unexpected comes up, that's good. Don't try to plan it, just sort of like, see what your body is asking for.
Okay. Find your way to a stopping point. And we're just gonna put that on pause for a minute. We're gonna like, let that go. We got something on paper. We wrote something, we said something. Now we're gonna go and we're gonna imagine, we're gonna do something that none of us are doing right now. We're gonna go to a party and we're gonna write a party scene. And when you write this party scene, I do not want you to use character headings. When I write group scenes, I never, ever, 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 ever use character headings. I never like know who the characters are before I write. I literally just write like a stream of consciousness of voices. And then after I've written it, I go back and I see who's talking. So I let the voices come first. And then after I've written it, I go back and I'm like, oh, this is this person. This is this person. This is this person. This is who's at this party. So we're all now gonna write a party scene. We're gonna imagine what it feels like many months from now when this is all over and we get to like go to a party and we get to like get drunk and we get to like be close to people and we get to dance and we get to be together. And I'm gonna just give you some visual inspiration for what this party looks like. Um, so Dylan, whenever you're ready, you can show the first image. Um, okay, this is the party we're going to. This is by an artist named Jane County. And this is the party we're all going to together. I want you to start writing this party scene voices talking at a party like you're hearing them and i want you to make it as boring as possible the most boring party that you have ever been to whatever that means to you go for it The most boring party in the world. Post coronavirus, we're gathering together again. Put on your nylons. What are people saying to each other? What do they want to talk about? Who's not at this party? Who's missing? What are people not talking about? Maybe the doorbell rings. Someone's there who's just arrived. What's the food at the party? Is there food? What's the drink? What's the music? 
who's attracted to who, who's hitting on who, who can't stand the other person. Who fucked someone and now they're nervous to see them again. And if, the, if you're stuck, you can literally just write, what's up? What's up? How are you? How has your last six months been? How's it going? Good to see you. Oh my gosh, you look so cute. What's up? And just letting the voices come. You're not thinking about who's talking, just voices are spilling out. What's up, what's up, what's up? The most boring party in the world, but then something very dramatic happens, okay? Something crazy happens at this party. Dylan, when you're ready with the second picture, this crazy thing happens at this party in the middle of the party, you're all there, you're eating your cheese cubes, you're eating your tuna, whatever weird food is there, I don't know why there's tuna. You're drinking your drink, you're refilling the drink, people are dancing, exes are seeing each other, um, and then this happens in the middle of the party. You can, you can, I think that's technically, this is by Bill Trailer. I think that's technically a dog and a cat. It could, it, it can be a dog and a cat, or those can be metaphors for like two party guests who have that interaction. Are they fighting? Are they dancing? Are they fucking? Are they happy to see each other? I don't know, but this happens at the party and everyone is watching. Who are those two people? Who are those two animals? Are people ignoring them? Are people separating them? Are people joining them? And if you're stuck, you can literally just be writing down meow and woof, meow and woof. Maybe everyone starts meowing at this party. Maybe it feels good to write the word meow. I love that word, meow. It's such a cool word. Woof is a cool word too. Maybe everyone starts talking to the cat or talking to the dog. I love the way that people talk to animals, you know? And then the doorbell rings and someone shows up at the door very, very late. They're very, very late to this party. And Dylan, whenever you're ready with the third slide, this is who shows up.
anticipation, excitement. There he is. This is a sculpture by John Pasternak. This guy comes in late. What's his name? Give him a name. Everyone says, hi. Dylan. John, Elmira. Why is he late? Where's he coming from? What does that guy have to say? Change your pen if you want a different pen. Change your paper if you want a different paper. Returning to the rhythm of the party. People who are so happy to be together. have group conversation. How are you doing? Now I want you to pick one voice, let it emerge. And I want you, I want that one person to go up to another person. And I want that person to tell that person how they want to be touched. And I want you to remember what you wrote at the beginning of the exercise, how you want to be touched. Don't look at it. Don't turn the pages back. Don't go back from your memory. What, how does this person want to be touched? And have them say it to another person. This is what I want. This is what I need. This is how I want to feel. This is how I want you to make me feel. This is how I want someone to make me feel. This is how I want the rain to make me feel. Whatever it is, do it from memory. How they want to be touched. One person telling another person, ending in a monologue.
to a stop. So strange, I wish I was in the room with you. One of my favorite things, I haven't done a ton of teaching, but one of my favorite things about like writing with other people is like being in the room and like um, getting a sense of like how people are doing and like what's, when it's flowing and when it's sticking and stuff. So thank you for your patience as I sort of like imagine <laughs> you out there and wish you were um, here with me, but I hope that it's just a little bit of fun and I hope there was a little bit of creative spark for you and all of that. So yeah, that's the end of our writing exercise. We'll say goodbye to that little guy. Hi, Carl. Hi, I came back, but if you want more Hello. time, I can disappear. No, 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 I'm good. I'm good. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claire. That was so fun. Was um, I named my little John Pasternak sculptor guy, Mr. Ladybug. Oh, cute. I would not have met him without your help, so thank you. Um, <laughs> but now we want to shift into a Q&A uh, section, and I will just start us off with a question from our Zoom Q&A, which is, I remember once reading that you didn't really do much rewriting on your plays, which I love to hear. Is that still your approach? Could you talk more about your approach to revisions, rewriting, and when you know when your play is done? 
What a great question. Um, so Maria Stryer, who runs Club Thumb, taught me how to rewrite a play. I, I, my first play ever was at Club Thumb with their Summer Works Festival. And I gave her the play and I was like, I don't rewrite. <laughs> so there, there it is, like, <laughs> see, ya, see ya in May. And she was like, okay, let's talk, let's talk. And she taught me that rewriting actually could be like really creative. I remember one of the things we did in that play is I rearranged the order of the scenes and I printed all the, I basically printed the entire play out like 90 pages. And then I laid it out in a room and I started like moving things around. And I was like, oh my God, this is actually kind of fun and really creative. Um, and that unlocked rewriting for me like when rewriting is structural I really really enjoy it when you get to sort of like structure you know it, it's something that I feel like a lot of people are afraid of with playwriting but it's actually like to me the most fun part it's like when you get the building blocks and you get to like move them around and be like Aaron Courtney talks about like all the different shapes of a play like making a circle play or a, sh a play that's shaped like a bow tie or all of like I remember when I was um working on my play, You Got Older, the revision I did in that play was I had all of this material and all of these scenes. And I realized that I had all of these scenes that were two handers for just two people. And then I had this one huge group scene where the whole family congregated. And I realized, um, I was like, oh my gosh, actually what a satisfying structure if you go from all these like spare two-hander scenes to this like big party and then you go back to two-hander scenes. Like those two-hander scenes will feel so much more uh, lonely like after this big party. And so that's the kind of rewriting I love when it's super structural. Um, the kind of rewriting I hate is like when a tiny little piece of a play is just like not working and you like rewrite two pages like 40 times. That's what I was like talking about earlier. And um, the, this this lovely question asker, where I, I have, I still feel like huge chunks of I think I'm a slow writer so I don't write plays quick I don't write them often but then often when I like give birth to like a section of a play it kind of comes out whole like every play I've ever written there's just huge like 50 pages that like never change it's just like that's the way they came out and they stay and I think that's great and if you're like that I think that's great I often think the first draft is the best draft so I'm super anti <laughs> revision but if you can find a way to make rewriting fun especially in these structural ways where you're really thinking of, um, creatively about theater and like what um, a exciting night in the theater is then I think rewriting can be like really rewarding yeah cool um, I've got a question from YouTube. Oh, it uh, is moving around. Let me find it. Okay. Um, this is from Porva, who happens to be a playwright Horizons MVP. Uh, when in your playwriting process do you invite collaborators into the process, directors, designers, actors? That's such a great question. Um, I think that's so personal. I know writers who um, essentially write with a director or write with a trusted collaborator. So it's like they write 10 pages of something and then they like talk about it with someone and then that inspires them to write more. For me, I really like to have like a, a first draft before I show it to anyone. But I would say that for me, um, a first draft is normally 50 pages, which is not the length of a full length play. So most of, most of my plays end up being around like 90 to like 110 pages and so my first my first drafts are normally like little miniature shrunken heads they're like 50 pages of like the the cosmos of the play and then I sort of like stretch it stretch it stretch it stretch it and like grow it so for me I like to have that 50 pages just so I can get myself out there but I do know a lot of artists who um work with collaborators to grow their play. But the, the thing that I really want to say that I think is really important, you do not have to take notes from anyone you do not want to. I am like, I will work at a theater and not take notes from the artistic director. Like I'm very, very picky about who I take notes from, which doesn't mean I don't care what people think about my work and I'm open and I want to hear and stuff. But like, I just have seen so many plays die from being noted to death and getting like, cause you'll be in a writer's group and then like 20 people will give you like feedback that all contradicts each other. And then you'll try to do all of those notes 
and then it'll destroy the play. So mm -hmm. I am so I, and I encourage you to it's um, you choose who gives you notes. Don't just take them from anyone. It's like really choose who you trust, whose artistic taste you trust, and then invite them, invite their thoughts on the play, but put yourself in the power position even though often as playwrights and artists we feel disempowered and we have to we feel like we have to say like thank you so much for this opportunity no like you have like treat yourself like a boss and like ask the person you want for help ask them and like be be the boss in that situation don't be the don't be the like grateful party if that makes sense it's awesome totally um so we've got a, a question from Zoom. How do you approach writing characters whose lived experience is so different from your own? Characters of different races, genders, et cetera. That's such a great, these are all such great questions. You know, that's that's a question I really appreciate because it's something that I'm struggling with very much myself as a writer right now. So I feel like if I'm really honest, every character in my play is me. I feel like I'm such like an autobiographical writer um, I'm, you know, also like very in my own emotions <laughs> that like my play Dance Nation, people always ask me, which of those girls are you? And I'm like, I'm all of them. Like, I'm really all of them. Like my lived experience is all of them, but that's complicated because then you, because like, if just, again, taking Dance Nation, the people who played those roles were very different from me, different ages, different races, different sexualities. So like, what is that chasm between me and my lived experience and that actor and their lived experience? And, and, and um, I just think it's, a, so it, I'm, it's tricky because I think you write plays the way you write plays. So I think I'm always going to be writing autobiographical plays, but I think it's a really responsible question to be like, what does it mean to write a character who's different than me and how do I honor um, that different experience? And I, I guess this is not a helpful answer. It's just that I'm also like struggling with that question and something that I'm, that I'm thinking about and trying to figure out. Totally. Um, okay, I have another question from YouTube. This is from Claire, another Claire. Um, how do you find inspiration? Is it found text? Is it little things that happen to you during your day? Did Dance Nation come from a moment watching Dance Moms or more of a thought or emotion? All of my plays are inspired by trauma in my life. <laughs> like every play I've ever written is basically about the thing that's like killing me. Mm -hmm. um, that's the type of writer I am. Deb Margolin, who I um, shouted out earlier, who is so amazing. She used to say like, write today what you need to say if you're gonna die tomorrow. And that's kind of how I write. So like, if I look at my, um, plays it's like you got older it's a play it was my dad had stage four cancer we were told he was going to die like that's what that play is about that was the biggest thing in my life like I remember um because I got into the Soho Rep Writers Director Lab which was something that I wanted to do forever and I kept getting rejected I was never accepted and the year that I was applying um that my dad got sick um I wrote them a note that was like this is not a Soho Rep play and I feel really embarrassed to write this, but my dad just got diagnosed with cancer and that's the only thing I can write about. So I want to write a play about my dad's cancer and I was shocked, shocked to get in. But like Dance Nation is 100% about really painful struggles I was having around ambition and friendship and like trying to make it as an artist. Um, I had this play called I'll Never Love Again that was at the Bushwick Star that was about basically a toxic relationship I was in. Um, and I have this uh, other plays of mine, I have a play about it came from being sexually assaulted and another play that came from being bipolar. So for me, the inspir it's not, I'm sure little thing, like I pull from my life all the time. Like anyone who knows me is like embarrassed to go see my plays because they're like, that's me, that's me. That's this conversation we had. Like all the time something happens to me and I run to my room and I like write the exact like I steal, I'm a big stealer. Like everything's me, everything's autobiographical, but the, the engine of all, for me, the engine of all of these plays, it's always trauma. It's always like the things that have hurt me the most. That's what I write about for whatever, for better or worse. 
So um, another question from Zoom, I think kind of like touches on what you were just saying, um, but Jonathan Hogue is asking, how do you look at story in terms of objective and obstacle, traditional story structure um, through your own voice and style? And when do you know that you have enough of an idea to start a play? Well, first of all, I don't do the former thing at all. And I don't believe any, I don't believe in objectives. I don't believe in obstacles. I don't believe in traditional storytelling like that at all. I don't believe in it. I believe in writing bad plays, boring plays, weird plays, emotional plays. I don't believe that. At, and I think this is a great question. So don't, my passion is coming from like my church, not from like, I love this question. It's a great question. Like, it's just that I don't think as humans, we have objectives. I don't know what I want. Do you know what you want? I have no fucking idea what I want. And when I say something, I have no idea what I'm saying. I have no idea what I want to get from the other person 90% of the time. It's like 10% of the time that I'm in a situation with someone and I'm like, I want something from them and I'm going to like try to get it out of it. You're like, that's like literally like 10% of my life. 90% of my life, I'm just talking I have no idea what I'm saying. So for me, I'm more, that's when we were doing the party scene with the voices, I'm more of an auditory playwright. I love behavior and I love the way people talk. So I love, why did that person eat that, that cookie that way? I have no idea. And if you ask her, she has no idea why she wrote, eat, ate the cookie that way either. I like hearing conversations and that's a big, you know, I'm from Brooklyn College. That's like a big Mac Wellman thing going out into the world and eavesdropping. Mac always says that that's how you find your voice, like not with a laptop, but with a pen and paper. If you go out into the world, you eavesdrop on a conversation. Um, what you choose to write down, how you choose to edit, that is your voice. Like that's what you care about. That's what's important to you. you if you take 10 playwrights and you have them listen to the same conversation, and write it down, they will all write down different things because they will all be attracted to different things. So I'm much more like externally motivated, like the way people talk, the way be they behave. And I like the mystery. I like them not knowing. And I, you know, I don't work with plot either. That's like um, with a play like Dance Nation, I was like, okay, obviously they're going to a competition. And so that's the plot. The plot is the good competition. Like, okay, done. The plot's done. Like, the, like moving on. But that's also why some people don't like my plays. And that's also why my plays are not for everyone. And also that's maybe why my plays aren't super commercial. And there, there will be like a ceiling on um, what I can accomplish in my life because it's not for everyone. It's not. And I, I, when I watch, um, when I watch a piece of work that has amazing objectives and obstacles and plot and story, I fucking love it. Like I love watching that stuff. So it's not that I don't enjoy it or appreciate it. Um, it's just not what I, it's just not how I make work. And there was a second part of the question, but I forgot it. And I, um, Oh, how do you, how do you know when you have enough of an idea to start a play? I think for me, it's just knowing that I'm tapping into something like I was just talking about, that's really painful for me. So if, if I'm going to write about my dad, I know I could write, I could write five plays about my dad. You know what I mean? So for me, it's, it's knowing it's like a starter for bread as we're all making our sourdough bread and quarantine. Like I just need, I need a starter. So once I have a starter, like bipolar, I'm bipolar. Like that's something that I could literally write about for 10 years. Like it's, I just need something for me my work is so personal. I just need to know that I have that personal engine that, um, that there's some, I believe in writing plays that are risky for you to write. You should be afraid to write the play that you want to write. It should make you uncomfortable. It should make you feel like maybe I shouldn't be writing this. That's, that's how I feel. And I, once I get that feeling of like, I'm scared to put this down on paper, that's when I know that I have an idea that's going to keep going. It's really exciting. Um, okay, questions from YouTube, uh, sort of a two-parter. The first part is from Rin. What is the difference for you uh, between writing in a formal program versus writing on your own? And then the sort of second part would be, where would you recommend people serious about learning the craft of playwriting go to do that? Um, so I'm, I, I haven't been in a formal program for a while. I also haven't written a, I haven't written a play in four years, you guys. I did a checkoff ad adaptation this year um, that was supposed to happen in May and June, but I haven't written an original play 
in a little while. And I think it's partly because I've been out of, because I was in Brooklyn College and I wrote four plays in Brooklyn College. Two of those plays are fucking trash. I'll never look at them in my entire life. And then two of those plays I love. And um, one of them was Dance Nation. And another play is a play that I hope will happen when um, this coronavirus stuff is over. And then before that, I was in Youngblood. And Youngblood is a writer's group for writers under 30. And you have to write one play a year. And I swear to God, if I had not been in Youngblood, I would never be a playwright. Because I joined Youngblood when I was an actor. And I was like, yeah, I had written like this one play and I got into Youngblood and then I like, didn't write for like nine months. Again, I'm not a disciplined writer. I didn't write for like nine months. And then they were like, you have to do your reading. I was like, fuck, I have to write a play. And so then I wrote a play really fast. So for me, I'm realizing that I think I actually need those external structures. So Youngblood was amazing for me. Brooklyn College was amazing for me. I know Club Thumb has an early career writers group. There's, I really recommend getting yourself in a writers group, but I also know like it's fucking competitive. Like I applied for that shit for years and like you don't get in. So you, if you don't get into a writers group, I really encourage you to create your own writers group. I'm currently in a created writers group and lots of people do that. It's totally normal. It's totally fun. So just like find people, you know, who's writing, you respect your friends and like create a thing and be like, okay, we're going to, for the next three months, we're going to meet once a day, once a week on Fridays and like share plays. I think those kind of structures like really, really, um, help yeah um so you just mentioned being an actor and katie from zoom is wondering how has starting out as an actor affected your work i think that's why my work uh, i always write um i think um i always write parts that i would want to play um i mean so as an actor i only worked as a 15 year old which is a huge part of like um where dance nation came from because i had spent like years playing like teenage girls um and so I had a lot of thoughts and feelings about um what it means to play a teenage girl um and wait I'm blanking on the specificity of this question it was just how is starting out as an as an actor affected your work? affected my playwriting um yeah I, I think I think very bodily I always think of you know there's always things in my plays like Dance Nation has all this dance in it. I've written another play with a lot of dance in it. I love dance. I love to dance. So these are things that like I would just get off on, on doing as an actor. I like sort of like extreme, I like extreme stuff on stage. That's sort of like what turns me on as an actor. Uh, um, and so, yeah, but yeah. So I think that's the main, I mean, I think that's the main yeah, I think that's the main thing that it's influenced. Cool. Um, okay, a question from Zoom from Evelena. What draws you to certain collaborators, directors, actors, designers, anyone? What makes you say, yes, that person, all caps? Such a good question. I wish I had a better answer. The right collaborators are the most important thing to making theater. <laughs> like it's literally the most important thing. And for me, I feel like you don't know until you actually are making the thing with the person. And then it's like too late if it's not working out. So like, right. I'm trying to refine my gut on that. And just like a gut feeling, you know, there's a few, um, there's a few things you start to identify like that are like, I really, I, I really care about, um, actors who are specific with language and really particular about language. Like that's something that's like really important to me. I really like directors who have like a really strong visual sense because like that's not my strong suit. And so I like to work with people who like have strengths that I don't have. And so like you start to kind of like figure out those aren't like general things that can apply to everyone, but you start to kind of like figure out like what your priorities are. I like weird actors. Like I like, um, I like, I don't know how to say, I, I'm also, I mean, I, I mean that as a compliment. Like I, I, weird is like the highest compliment I can give. Like I, I like weirdos and I like actors who um, feel ancient, like they, whatever age they are, they feel sort of like um, pagan and ancient. Like those are just qualities I like. So I think it's more about you for yourself starting to like learn what works for your play and like what's exciting for your particular play I need directors for me I need a director who's really comfortable with a strong playwright because I'm extremely vocal in the room and I have a lot of opinions about design 
about music, about everything. So like, I don't, I could never work with a playwright, uh, with a director who's like, the playwright doesn't talk in the room or like, I would like to give all the notes to the actor. Like, fuck you, that's not my style. Like, so if you feel like you're the only one who can talk to the actors, then we're not gonna work together because I need to be able to like say things directly to the, the actors in my own voice with my own word choice in my own way. So you just, there's no like right answer, but you just start to kind of learn like what, what works. And then you start to like have those hard conversations. Like when you're talking to a potential director being like, how do you feel about me? Like talking directly to the actors and like, like giving notes, does that make you uncomfortable? But the big, you know, thing for all of this is just like communication. Like that's the biggest thing is just being, getting to know who you are as an artist and then being able to communicate that to your collaborator and being able to like, not be afraid of conflict and be like, how do you feel about this? Are you down to like do it this way? And um, yeah, yeah, but it's definitely a skill that grows. I feel like the more you work. Cool. Um, I'm gonna combine a question from Zoom and YouTube. Someone was wondering, so, or noting that it's so interesting that you write plays about trauma, um, but have to feel good to write them. So how do you make yourself feel good enough to write? And then kind of along these lines, Eric from YouTube was wondering, do you write negative slash sad scenes in a positive slash happy personal space? Such great questions. Wait, I'm writing them now. Negative, sad scenes, happy, in a positive, play. happy personal space. Write about trauma, but have to feel good. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think, first of all, when I say I feel good when I write, I don't mean that I'm like, ha ha ha, I'm so happy. Like, I feel like happy. I mean, I feel good the way you feel good when you're getting fucked the way you deserve to get fucked. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like, it feels like when, when someone fucks me really good, I cry. Like, and that's my ideal type of writing. Like my, the, when I say the, the best writing I do, I'm crying. I'm crying. The best writing I do, I'm crying. And it's that similar thing as I don't feel happy. So good is maybe like a bad word catharsis is maybe like a better word it's like an emotional release where like my body is like releasing something that needs to be released and it feels therapeutic so um yeah it's like it's like something that's why i think for me i don't write every day because i carry that shit around in me for weeks and then it's like that perfect moment where like for whatever reason it starts to come out of your body it's almost like this is so gross it's almost like when you're popping a pimple you know that you've been like waiting for a week to pop and you've been like it like hurts and you're like okay the head is coming the head is coming the head is coming and then like you pop a pimple and it feels good it's that kind of good it's like that it's not like happy good it's like pus good it's like um it's like uh so for me the trauma feels bad but having agency in the face of trauma feels good. I wrote, you got older in my father's hospital room. It's so embarrassing. It's horrible. Like it's horrible. I was writing sex scenes next to my, my, my father is alive. I have to always say this because the dad in the play dies, spoiler alert, but my dad got emergency, um, not emergency, experimental cancer treatment and survived. But when I was in his hospital room and it was, um, not looking good. I was like writing sex scenes like in his hospital room and like that experience as perverse as it sound be, be, because it is perverse. It gave me like relief to like write. Like I felt better in that moment writing next to him. It gave me a release. So that's what I mean when I say it like feels good. It feels like something that needs to come out is like um, coming out and so I that's I guess in some ways that's the same answer for the like negative sad scenes from a happy place it's not it's not that I'm in a happy place it's that something about writing those really dark scenes I mean that's what it feels like I feel like when someone hurts you like this is uh, it, the, the thing that sucks about getting hurt is that you can't do anything about it most of the time like that's the thing that like so terrible about getting hurt but the superpower of being a writer is that when someone hurts you, you can do something with it. Like you can literally
literally do something with it. You can make something that then becomes a positive artifact in the world, even if it is about like pain. So like that's that's where that kind of lives for me is like um, using writing to do something with pain that I'm feeling that ends up making me feel better about being alive. And then also like for me, I'm a, I feel like my plays are funny and like humor is really important to me. So like being able to bring humor into traumatic situations feels um, empowering to, to me, to me personally. And this is everything I'm saying tonight is like so personal and just my coping mechanisms. And you might be hearing it and be like, that's not me at all. I don't like that at all. I disagree. And that's great. I think, I think like one of the biggest things about being a playwright is like finding your own way to do it. So I really empower you all to like find your own thing, your own way. That's very powerful. Thank you. Um, I mean, I don't know. Should we, we, we could do another question or, or we, could, we could wrap it up. I mean, that was such a fantastically like great sort of ending moment, I'm, I'm torn. Um, Maybe one more question along the line of endings. Um, somebody's wondering, Alyssa from YouTube is wondering where slash how slash when do you find the endings of your plays? Good one. That's such a great question too. And I wanna, I want, so I was, I keep talking about the Soar Prep Writer Director Lab, but it was just like such a formative experience in my life. And that was largely because of Jenny Schwartz and Ken Rushmole who, who ran it when I was in it. So they had us, I wrote You Got Older in that, lab and um the first thing they had us do was write a boring scene and that became the beginning of my play and the second thing they had us do was write the ending of the play and it, it's actually making me emotional just thinking about it because like how crazy to write the ending of the play first like you know that's so um strange but I thought it was such like an empowering exercise. So maybe it's something you could try on your next play. It's just like write that ending like right away. Like I love it when the ending is obvious, but then like, I also think it's great to be open to surprise. Like with Dance Nation, I wrote the ending really early. It was the pussy chant. Like I wish that my soul was as perfect as my pussy. And that was the ending of the play for a long time. And then I realized like, fuck, I need Amina to come back and say that she's gonna fucking destroy everyone and win. Like the play can't end on like pussy power. The play needs to end on like, I'm gonna fucking be the best, sorry. <laughs> like, you know what, I, I'm, I'm like describing it badly. I hope it's better than that. But like, um, <laughs> but like I, that was a weird thing where like I wrote the ending of the play and then like years later, I was like, oh no, that's not the end. This is the end. And I, ch and I changed it. Um, but I love, for me, I love gestural endings. Like um, what, my play I'll Never Love Again was all about this like 15 year old relationship and it was performed. It was, it was a play that I wrote um, before Dance Nation sort of like in tangent with it. And um, it was people of all ages um, singing the story of my first relationship when I was 15. And so you're spending all this time with people of all ages. And then at the very end of the play, an actual 13 year old girl walked out on stage. And so like, that was the ending. It was like seeing this like 13 year old person and being like, fuck, that's so young. Like, I can't believe all this shit is gonna happen to her. You know, like that, that gesturally became the ending. You got older ends with a dance number. It literally ends with a party with a dance number and like the sound of breath. So like, I love gestural endings, but they come, I think they come as apparitions. The ending of You Got Older, I remember I was dancing to like a song. Um, it's Pitbull, um, uh, why can't I remember what it's called? Why can't I remember it? It's the, it's the end of the play. It's um, that Pitbull song with Kesha. What's, what is it? What is that song? Oh, I'll, I'll do some research. <laughs> uh, Timber, Timber. I was listening to Timber and I was crying about my dad dying. And I was like, that's the end of the play. The end of the play is crying about my dad dying, dying while like listening to Timber like that. So sometimes it like hits you like an apparition like that. There's the end. Um, but the ending is so important. And I think it's really fun to figure out and it can come at any time. It can come right in the beginning or it can come right at the end. Um, and I encourage you to like play around with it. Yeah. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, Claire. Yeah, this Bye. has been really extraordinary. Thank you so much for being so generous. Thanks, everyone. I wish I could see you all, but I'm imagining you. <laughs> um, so just as, as we close here before we um, we're throwing that slide up, but uh, we, we do have two more of these digital masterclasses on the books right now. Uh, one a week from tonight on May 18th with Michael R. Jackson, who wrote A Strange Loop, and then on Monday, June 1st at 7 p.m. Eastern with Larissa Fasthorse, whose play, The Thanksgiving Play, we got to do at Playwrights a couple years ago. So um, phnyc.org slash perspectives to sign up for those, uh, if you haven't already. Um, is there anything else? Um, yeah. And the only the only last thing is, um, if you're inclined at all to support Playwrights Horizons and the POP program, we'd be so grateful. You can visit phnyc.org slash donate or even just text pop ph to 44321. It's on the slide. Um, and we'll post that info in the chat as well. Um, and also if you wanna share any reflections or insights about your experience tonight, we would like be so grateful to hear from you. You can write to Carl and I both at pop at phnyc.org. Um, and we hope you and your loved ones are continuing to take care and staying safe in these weeks um, and the weeks ahead. Um, and we can't wait to see you back at uh, Playwrights Horizons on 42nd Street. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you everyone. And thank you again, Claire. Thank you guys, such a pleasure. Be well, everyone. You too. Bye.